I've been missing the neon lights Trying to find all the places I go <laughs> hey, hi, hello. I'm Ashley Hoover Baker, tasteofreality.com's gossip guru, self proclaimed fangirl, and pop culture enthusiast with a sweet spot for nostalgia. You're listening to On This Day Entertainment, a podcast all about the greatest reality TV and pop culture happenings from today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Welcome to the Fanny Pack. In the words of Bethany Frankel, it's time to mention it all. Without further ado, for this week in reality TV and celebrity news, we kicked off the week with a new reality show. Well, new to me. I didn't know how much I needed this in my life. It's funny. My husband always says that, um, well, besides reality, one of my preferred TV and movie genres would be called Teenagers with Secret. I mean, I grew up watching Nano 210. I loved Pretty Little Liars, Gossip Girl, you name it. I watched it. Well, this show, Love Island, is exactly that for my sister. My sister's genre of choice would be bikini-clad singles on islands. So this checks all of her boxes. I had to dive into this one. So sorry for that cheesy pun. I'm obsessed. So Love Island is not at all on an island this year. It's actually here in Vegas, a desert. Okay, but hello, we've been in quarantine for 25 years now, it feels like, and there's no travel. <laughs> no other countries want us right now. And well, it looked like the rooftop of the Cromwell here in lovely Las Vegas was the best place for him. And can I tell you, I'm not mad. I have only been, so the show takes place on the roof deck. There's this like huge pool deck of the Cromwell. And when things are open, it's actually called Dre's. Dre's is a famous nightclub that's been here for 20 something years. Like Dre's nightclub is like in the basement it's like after hours it opens well I guess it opens at like 10 or 11 but it doesn't get going until like 2 3 in the morning I didn't know that you weren't supposed to go to Dre's until your classes the next morning at UNLV so I was leaving Dre's at like 8 a.m going to a 9 a.m class and that might be one of the reasons why it took me seven and a half years to earn a bachelor's degree but that's a story from another day well, as many times as I've been to Dre's, the nightclub, I had only been to the beach club where Love Island is taking place once. I went because the Backstreet Boys were hosting a party there. So if the Backstreet Boys are there, I'm going to be there. So I went. It was so expensive. It was like $25 just to get in. I ordered one drink. I didn't order a double. I didn't order. I just said, I want a pina colada. It's like a million degrees here. Do you know that a pina colada cost $45, $45 for one drink at that pool lounge? So those sexy singles are very lucky they're not paying for their own drinks. The show is so ridiculous. Everybody on the first episode, they all pulled up to the hotel in like a Ferrari or one of those like tricked out like Hummers or whatnot. The girls got out of the car in their bikinis, which is just perfection. The guys came out in their swim trunks. It is literally a meat market and I love it. There is a host who generally these like cutesy type girls who are like, oh, I'm silly, I'm quirky. I find very annoying, but I actually find her very charming. I think her name's Arielle Vanderberg. And then there's a man who does the voiceovers and oh my God, he's so shady and I love it so much. I don't watch CBS reality. Like I don't watch Big Brother. I've never watched one of their shows. So this might be very similar to other formats of this network that I'm just not familiar with, but Love Island, I'm here for it. If you haven't started, it just started this week, but it's like so many episodes. It's Monday through Friday, if I'm not mistaken, plus a Saturday episode that's like a wrap up of the week and then maybe some like bonus footage and uncut, unseen, whatever. So I'm here for it. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to keep up with it because I got shit to do and that's a lot of TV. But I'm invested and I can't wait to hear if you guys are. Also, we had some good news. Well, 
bittersweet news, I guess we should say. Great news for Garcelle Beauvais. Of course, the queen from the Jamie Foxx show coming to America. Most recently, she has been on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills this season. And she was just hired as the new host of The Real. So we've seen even just this one season of Garcelle. She doesn't mind getting into those awkward conversations. She'll bring it up even when it's not comfortable. So it sounds like a perfect fit for me. There's been rumors that she's not coming back to Housewives because of the real. I haven't heard that officially, but I don't think she would come back anyway because it wasn't. Let's be honest. She's above it. Lisa Rinna might not be above it, but Garcelle Beauvais is. Some drama from the RuPaul world. If you were watching Canada's Drag Race, I'm so jealous. I have got to get on it. I don't have VH1, so I have to go to my mom's house. And I can't afford to buy them like I used to. So I'm going to have to go to my mom's house and watch. But that super hot judge, he was on the most recent season of Drag Race as a judge on one of the more recent episodes. He's the black guy. He's tall. He's slender. He had that really ridiculous scene with RuPaul where RuPaul was like, this little acting sketch that they never do. It was very bizarre. Like, oh, I see you looking at me and we can't do it. We can't keep on going. And it was just so bad. Anyway, apparently Jeffrey Boyer Chapman has deleted his Twitter after being widely criticized for his critiques on the show. Um, He's a judge. Isn't it his job to judge? So when I was reading about it, they said he was kind of going maybe for like a Simon Cowell type vibe, which if we're talking about honesty, I think is exactly what you should be doing on a reality show, especially a competition show where you're trying to grow. But if he's just being mean, that's where I draw the line. If you're just being mean and like borderline or like bullying people, that's... A problem. I can't really say because I haven't seen this season, but I am just shaken that another RuPaul's Drag Race staffer has deleted all of their social media. RuPaul wiped out his, as did Tyra Sanchez and Michelle Visage. So we need answers here. Until we get those answers, let's move on to Tuesday's news. This shook me and all Real Housewives of New York fans to our collective Apple cores. We learned that Dorinda Medley announced her Real Housewives of New York departure. She came out first thing in the morning on Tuesday with a statement on Instagram. She said, quote, what a journey this has been. I have laughed and cried and tried to make it nice, but all things must come to an end. This was a great outlet for me to heal when my late husband Richard passed away. I have met so many interesting people and learned so much about myself, about life and about women along the way. Thank you to Bravo and NBC for the incredible ride and to my castmates for constant stimulation and entertainment. I wish you all health, happiness and success. Very nice, right? Well, keep in mind, Bravo is really good about doing that to where they'll allow the housewife to make the statement first, even when it looks like they've been fired, because now it's coming out that Dorinda may have been fired because audiences have turned on her in these last couple years because she's such a mean, nasty drunk. And can I just say, I am one of those people. I love Dorinda. I'm going to always miss what she brought to the, I mean, I think she was on for seven years. Her first handful of seasons were perfection. Christmas without Dorinda will never be the same. The Berserkers will just, I, I'm going to be watching, when everybody else is watching like Christmas movies, that's when I break out the Berserkshire episodes. So this hits really hard, but Dorinda's just been so mean lately. She was horrendous to Tinsley earlier this season. And honestly, for me, when she made that comment about Tinsley and the turkey baster, that was truly just a new low. And I've really had a hard time with Dorinda since that. And to think, and I thought of this the other day, actually, just this most recent episode that was just on when we saw her daughter, Hannah, I was just thinking like, heaven forbid this woman, this young woman would have some sort of difficulty conceiving or 
maintaining a child that sh- that has been conceived, whatever the case may be, I would hope to God nobody would speak to Hannah to the way that Dorinda spoke about Tinsley. And these are the conversations that I think Dorinda needs to start having with herself. I'm going to talk about Dorinda more in just a minute when I break down the Zoom event I attended with Luann De La Seps and Carson Cressley. So hold on for that for just a moment. In the meantime, let's jump over to Wednesday's news because this was just a crazy piece of news. Love and Hip Hop Hollywood star Masika Kalisha, if I'm saying that wrong, I'm so sorry. This woman faked her own kidnapping for her OnlyFans account. I know that's a lot to take in. Let me break it down. Masika goes online, she's on Instagram, and has this video of her. She's wearing black underwear and a black bra, and she has giant bruises on her thigh, on her shoulder, scratches on her face. I mean, she looks roughed up. She's crying, saying, they're coming back. I need your help. I'm trapped. Letting us think, you know, audiences think that she's been kidnapped. Already, within seconds of seeing this video, I was so skeptical because the cuts, it's not just like one cell phone piece of footage. It's broken into little sections and edited together. So either the person used TikTok to create the edits or the new Instagram Reels feature, but there are quick edits in it, which makes me very curious because this is allegedly a ransom video. Anyway, later on in the video, and I guess the video was an Instagram post and a story because when it was in the story, there was a swipe up feature. And even in the video, she's like, if you guys want to help me, please, please help me. I need money. Go ahead and donate in my OnlyFans account so they can take the money. And that'll, you know, apparently be the ransom that the alleged kidnappers needed. So... Very shortly after this video was out, she came out with another video in a bathrobe, still bruised up, and she was like, this was not a real video. I'm so sorry if I scared anybody. Well, she said, I apologize if I scared anybody. Nowhere in video two did she apologize for being insensitive to victims of abuse, of kidnapping, I, the fact that she was in her bra and underwear would have, you know, maybe lent people to think that maybe there was some sort of trafficking going on. Any of that, she didn't apologize for any of those things, which I'm just appalled by. I mean, good Lord, woman. Honestly, the second video was almost as bad as the first because in the second one, she's like, this is all for a project I'm working on where I wanted to educate people about sex trafficking. And the excuse was like, really, really bad. Like if she would have just came out and said, I am so sorry. I'm such an idiot. This should have never happened. It won't happen again. No excuse. I'm sorry. That's it. People would have moved on, but this looks really bad. Like it's really, really bad. People are pissed that she was using something, a serious matter like this to monetize for people to join her OnlyFans account. The whole thing is insane. It's insensitive. And, you know, I talk about cancel culture a lot on this podcast and how I don't really think it exists because unless you're in jail, like, you know, Bill Cosby or Harvey Weinstein, like those people truly are canceled. They don't work. But even like Chris D'Elia, he's going to be performing live stand up in Florida like next month or something and it just came out a couple months ago that he grooms young girls before he sleeps with them so clearly we've got a very faded version of what's right and wrong as far as the entertainment we take in but I'm just gonna say and this is a real problem this is a real problem this is a conversation here Chris D'Elia, for instance, he's just one of a million white, cis white men that keep on going and live their life and eventually build a career again. Stassi Schroeder, I talked about last week from Vanderpump Rules, months after being fired from Vanderpump Rules for her racist disposition, she's already getting offers as soon as her contract is expired. She's got offers. I truly don't believe cancel culture exists. But, and this is disgusting, but the fact that this is a black woman, she actually might get canceled because people are going to be harder on her because of the color of her skin. 
There, I said it. So I don't necessarily believe in cancel culture. I think it's really limiting and it doesn't give people a chance to grow. So I would love, in a perfect world, I would love to see, I don't know this woman, Masika, if I'm even saying it right, I don't watch the show, but she needs to do better. And if she becomes an advocate, an ally for the crimes that she was exploiting, Maybe a redemption song would be played for her. We shall see what happens. Well, on Thursday, while we're talking about activism, this woman is walking the walk, talking the talk, and fighting the fight. Real Housewives of Atlanta's Portia Williams has just been amazing this summer in this terrible time of race wars in this country. Portia Williams has been arrested yet again in Louisville for protesting the death of Breonna Taylor. But the good news that follows is big picture good news. Bravo has announced that they're actually going to be airing all of Portia's activism and her arrests. And we will be seeing it on the new season of Atlanta, which I am so here for. It looks like Nene Leakes might officially be out of the cast, which for me as an Atlanta super fan would be the best things possible. We know that Ava Marcel left and it looks like Marlo and Tanya are coming back as friends of. For the rest of the cast, everybody's going to stay the same except we have two new housewives. One is an influencer and her name is Latoya Alley. And then there is an actress named Drew Sedora. So I'm here for that. I'm here for Portia, Queen Portia, doing the work. And the snitch who told this information to TMZ said, quote, Producers want to shine a light on Portia's fight for social justice as much as possible in the new season because Bravo knows viewers would be riveted by Portia's commitment to racial justice. And we are. We are here for it. So, Portia, thank you for what you are doing for the world. And PJ is going to be so proud when she's old enough to know exactly what you've done. It's freaking awesome. Moving on to Friday's news, let's start off with the good stuff. I ended up doing a write-up of the Sonage skincare event that I attended. It was a Zoom event hosted by Countess Luann and Carson Kressley, of course, from the original version of Queer Eye and RuPaul's Drag Race. They had a spill the tea session and people who bought Sonage skincare and some Bravo influencers got to be a part of the Zoom call. And I was one of those people. So that was super cool. We might have been like 20, 25 of us. And they had the most fun chat. And if you want to read all about it, make sure you go to onthisdayentertainment.com. You can read the full scoop where Luann and Carson dish on Leah in her first season. She talks about Dorinda's departure. She tells an amazing story about gift bags. Um, from Sonage that she had given the cast members. You guys are going to love this. So she gave everybody in the cast a gift bag from Sonage. The bas- I mean, it's a very high-end, amazing package. Like, anybody would be so lucky to get this. Carson and Lou were talking, and it came out that Lou only got a thank you from Sonia and from Leah. Neither Ramona nor Dorinda even said thank you for their gift. And that is just the rudest thing ever. Ramona, not surprised, especially since she has uh, her stupid skincare line. But Dorinda, I mean, it's a gift. You say thank you. Rude, rude, rude. I did love that story, though. Some other topics that Carson and Lou discussed, I'm not sure if their interview is ever going to be released, if the Zoom session is ever going to be like a thing. So I went ahead and just put down, I just jotted down a couple of bullet points that they talked about. One thing I loved is that they dished on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills because both of them watched the show, you know, just kind of on and off. Carson, who's actually friends in real life with Garcelle, said he was worried that she was too nice for the Beverly Hills Housewives but thinks that she held her own. 
He said about the Beverly Hills cast, quote, that's a tough crowd. And then he also said that uh, Lisa Rinna scared him. So same Z's. Luann and Carson, neither one of them understand why anyone even cares about the Denise Brandy hookup. I think that's a consensus between all of us. Carson is confused as to why the ladies are on Team Brandy and not Denise, since Denise is actually their friend. And uh, same Carson. Lou is so funny. And I remember this. I actually got to meet Luann after her cabaret show here in Vegas. And she was so much funnier off of the stage not like in the production like just chatting with her backstage and watching her interact with her fans she was so hilarious and this was one of those great times <laughs> Lou said Denise had been quote caught with her pants down in all of her lies regarding the brandy hookup which was just so funny oh and in the article I mentioned when I mentioned the gift baskets from Sonage and Sonia being appreciative and giving a formal thank you to Luann Carson said oh she must have loved the basket and and Lou says yeah Sonia loves anything that's free and I died and I just like pictured her with her tag hanging off of her bathing suit knowing that she was going to go back and return it because that's our Sonia Rita. Luann mentioned how much she loved the editors on Roni when they were tallying up Ramona's friends at her birthday party. And I love that as well. I died. I died. And watching all the other people in the Zoom conferences reaction to this, Carson was like, I don't understand why the Beverly Hills cast went to Buca de Beppo. What am I missing? And we were all on mute. Everybody who attended this except for Carson and um, Luann were on mute the entire time. So we were like, I wish I could have raised my hand and been like, there, I'm Buca de Beppo because Dorit designed the room there. But we weren't given that opportunity. And that's probably a good thing because we would have taken that thing over. Lou dished that she got a home visit from Andy and baby Ben recently. Uh, she spilled on the Roni reunion saying that it was an 11 hour day that the chairs were six feet apart from each other. And she said that was not a bad idea for reunions. And that production was so annoyed with Ramona because they had to keep on reminding her to stay seated because she wanted to like wander around and it wasn't safe. It's just so Ramona. I had like legit flashbacks of teaching elementary school and kindergartners. They're like whack-a-mole. Like as soon as you get like two of them down, another one pops up and you get that one down and three more up. The struggle is real. Lou also talked about the home confessionals. I loved Carson for calling Ramona out for her backdrop looking subpar. And then Lou mentioned that she thinks production told her to up her game. And that's why she doesn't film in front of her microphone wave anymore so thanks for that that was not easy on the eyes Lou explained that Bravo had sent a box to each of the housewives like fully loaded boxes with all the equipment directions she said it was pretty much foolproof which is hilarious because they sound terrible um that Victoria helped her get her set up but later in the season thankfully the confessionals will get better because a covid tested staffer who was decked out in ppe equipment did house calls so thank goodness for that i felt so bad for lou on this one because she said that she had done for her home confessionals she had done two hours of makeup she did three hours of filming and then when she was wrapping up she realized she never hit record and girl same. Do you know how embarrassing it is, especially when you interview somebody that you have to say, oh, that whole thing, I didn't press record or, oh, that Zoom call we just did, uh, I didn't save it properly. Anything like that, like it is the worst. And I at least Lou didn't affect anybody else. It was just her, which sucks. There's nothing worse than having to um, admit to a guest, especially if it's like a celebrity guest that you fucked up like that. Ugh, been there. It's the worst. And she finished up by saying that, yes, Luann is still in touch with Jacques, and they had actually spoken earlier that day. So there you go. It's almost like you were at that event also. And can I just say, if Sinaj does another event, I believe to um, be able to go, you had to purchase one of Lou's survival kits and first of all, you're getting a beautiful basket of mists and creams and all these uh, different things. Look at Lou's skin. I mean, hello. If that's what she uses, I want some of that. 
So you would not only get the package, but 10% of the proceeds went to the charity that Lou works with that we saw featured a few episodes ago on Roni. And you get to go to the Zoom call. And it was amazing. Like as a Luann and Carson super fan, it was amazing. I wish we could leave the week off with that news. It was fun. It was light. But <sighs> I'm devastated. Everybody's devastated. I'm sure. <sighs> I can't believe Chadwick Boseman died. I mean, he was 42. He, of course, played T'Challa in Black Panther. He was battling cancer, colon cancer, for the last four years and just lost his battle at age 42 on August 28th. It's devastating, devastating. And to think what an amazing, strong man. Like, I know his work. And one thing I love about him is that he's told so many Black stories. He's played Jackie Robinson. He He's known for doing a lot of um, historical films, you know, telling stories of famous Black people. He really became famous, of course, with Black Panther, obviously. But just uh, in the last few hours since I heard of his death... I've been watching some award ceremonies where he's accepted awards and interviews. And what an amazing man, such an inspiration. And it's just absolutely devastating. There are no words. 2020 can suck a dick. Oh, and so can cancer. Fuck cancer. Fuck you, cancer. Holy shit. 42. Un- so unfair. And he had so much more to do. And his work and his legacy will live on forever. Ah, well, that does it for the week's On This Day Entertainment news. Please head on over to onthisdayentertainment.com. You can read all the full articles I wrote there for this piping hot tea and more. I'll be right back with this week's nostalgic look back in entertainment history. So stay tuned. Welcome back, Fanny Pack. Before we get started on this week's nostalgic look back, I wanted to remind you of the amazing product that you can get from curlbible.com. Curlbible is a small business owned by a black female that I have started supporting and I hope you can as well because these products are amazing. If you've ever seen me on social media, you know I'm a curly haired girl, but there is so much more to offer than hair products. Curl Bible has beauty, skincare. I've been obsessed with their Oh My Acne Bar. I've been using it on my face. It's helped my face so much. I was in need of a new moisturizer. So thanks to Curl Bible, so I was able to get a moisturizer that I am now obsessed with that I want to tell you about because not only is it an amazing product that helps your skin texture, softens the lines in the face and really gives you a glow without looking greasy. There's also a discount for On This Day Entertainment listeners. So if you go to curlbible.com, Once you get your order, make sure when you check out, use the code OTDE10 on this day entertainment 10 for 10% off. That way you'll get your discount. Please let me know what you get because I'm obsessed with this product. Every time I run out of one of the products I've been using, I've been replacing it with something from Curl Bible and I have yet to be disappointed. This is a great product for you. This is also a great product that gives back to a a black female owned business. And that way you're helping break all these antiquated, disgusting, systemic racist cycles of black people not having the same opportunities as so many of us have. Well, let's get back to it. It's always been fascinating for me to see how the world of entertainment has evolved over the years. So let's take a walk down memory lane and reminisce on some of the juiciest and most monumental on this day events from this week in pop culture history, going way back to 1972, because it's the debut of the longest running game show on CBS, The Price is Right. 
does anybody else associate the price is right with being sick from school? Like I always remember in elementary school, if I ever didn't feel good and needed to stay home, I would always, always, always watch the price is right. And I found great comfort in it. When the show started, it was hosted by Dennis James. And something interesting is that the version of Price is Right that we see now is the same structure it's always had, is that it's never changed formats. And we get the Price is Right rules where you bid, and if your bid is over, that means you're disqualified, and it goes to the person who's closest without being over. I think most of us use those rules in a lot of things. For me personally, I associate The Price is Right with Bob Barker. It has not been the same since Bob left the show. But this newer generation of Price is Right fans get Drew Carey and, you know, they don't know any better. So they are, I'm sure, just perfectly fine. Moving on to 78, classic horror film Dawn of the Dead premiered in Torino. Of course, it was directed by George Romero. And the movie followed a huge zombie epidemic where these creatures rise from the dead. There is a group, I think it was like a SWAT member, uh, a news journalist, and um, one of their girlfriends ended up hiding out in a secluded shopping mall. It's like a classic horror movie but then there was a great spoof called Shaun of the Dead which is amazing as well if you're a horror fan I'm sure you've seen them both if you're not it's a really great way to get into the genre also in 78 we had a wedding that is still around yes they've been married for 42 years singer Gloria Estefan and her musician slash producer husband Emilio Estefan who um, they were in Miami Sound Machine together. So uh, congratulations to them. Sadly, we had the anniversary of Princess Diana's death this week from 1997. In the early hours of August 31st, Princess Diana, of course, the Princess of Wales, died in a hospital after being injured in a limo as she was traveling in her Paris tunnel. Her partner at the time, and the driver were pronounced dead at the scene. Diana was 36 at her death. I remember that her bodyguard ended up surviving, and Diana's death was hours after. She She lived the longest of anybody in that accident that later did die. An investigation was carried out by French and British authorities, and it was concluded that the driver, Henry Paul, was responsible for the crash because he was drunk and on antidepressants when he lost control of the Mercedes and he had been speeding as he was trying to shake off the paparazzi. After six months of claims, counterclaims from the 250-ish witnesses, it was ruled that the deaths were considered a unlawful killing for the princess and her boyfriend, which is an equivalent to manslaughter. And they said it was also the paparazzi pursuing the princess's car so aggressively, as well as the driver, that should be blamed for the crash because of their, quote, gross negligence. And I have to just say this, and there are a bunch of conspiracy theories around everything involved with this. If the driver had been drugged and slipped alcohol, whatever the case may be, they said the paparazzi, they had all kinds of conspiracy theories about these deaths, including one, apparently neither Diana or her boyfriend were wearing seatbelts and it came out that maybe both of them would have survived that if they had worn their seatbelts and then people said, you know, maybe the seatbelts had been destroyed. Maybe they couldn't use them for some reason. They couldn't be deployed, whatever, whatever. I just thought it was interesting in the days of wearing masks that a mask can save your life. And there was one of those times when the seatbelt, which eventually became a law, but people were told to wear seatbelts before it became a law. And maybe that death could have, that horrendous death, the deaths, excuse me, could have been forbidden. So that's just my thoughts on that. That's my opinion!
Jumping over to 1993, the amazing Mariah Carey came out with the album Music Box, which is, of course, iconic because <laughs> it's Mariah. This album has Dream Lover, Hero, Anytime You Need a Friend, and Never Forget You, all classics. Hero is probably, I would say, Mariah's signature song only because, well, I would say like in her top three. And I say that because um, I've seen all three of her Vegas shows. I've been so fortunate to see Queen Mariah three times here. Every show she does, she did the number one show, which all of her singles that were number one were featured. The second one was her Christmas show where she did all of her Christmas music and three songs not Christmassy, and Hero was one of them. And then the last show that I saw, The Butterfly Returns, she had also done Hero, and uh, that was a show where she had just done her favorite song. So Hero was the one song I saw every time. So you can just take that how you will. Ew. The next year, in 94, the pedophile R. Kelly married a 15-year-old Aaliyah illegally in Rosemont, Illinois. The marriage was later annulled in February of 95. And I just remember reading about this and she had used a fake ID to get the marriage license. And that's how it legally happened. And I'm not sure exactly what led up to the annulment. But honestly, I really have a hard time with any of these stories about kids. I mean, the fact that this 25 year old man took advantage of a 15-year-old girl like this is just so gross. And as much as I love a good true crime case, these just really bother me. And especially with Aaliyah's untimely death, it all just sits so poorly. So that's one I just kind of looked over. So I'm just going to move on to the next year, which is 95. A show I didn't watch, but I remember it very much, was um, did you guys watch Xena Warrior Princess? It was only one season long and it became a huge cult classic. It starred Lucy Lawless and um, yeah, it wasn't my genre. I'm not really into that time period. So it was never something that I was even interested in watching. I don't think I've ever even seen an episode, but people loved that show. In fact, my husband uh, used to have a cat named Xena who was named after Lucy Lawless. So that's just a little fun fact. Happy birthday to Netflix. In 1997, Netflix was born. It was founded by Mark Randolph and Reed Hasting in Scotts Valley, California. If you don't remember, you young people, oh my gosh, I love having you young people here. I look at the age range of people who listen to the show and do you think of me as like a cool aunt or something? I don't know, but I appreciate it. Well, I'm assuming you think I'm cool. You might be listening like this is the lamest bitch I've ever heard in my life and you're just laughing, which if I'm providing laughs at all, that's a win. If I can provide any joy to you, I'm happy. So um, this is a little blast from the past for a lot of us, but for you youngins, in 97, Netflix, I know you guys have heard of Blockbuster, where you would actually physically go and rent movies, like walk in with money and leave with a video, like a VHS or a DVD, and uh, you would have to return it. Well, Netflix came out and they didn't have streaming. They actually had DVDs and you would have to order one in the mail and then they would send you a DVD that you would watch and then mail back. And it was a whole thing. Blockbuster, and this is a lesson in business to all of us, but Blockbuster could have easily jumped on that trend. They didn't. And then the times moved on without them. Netflix is still humongous. I'm actually looking forward to watching a couple things on Netflix this weekend, including that new um, video game special. I think it's called High Scores. And uh, there was something else I wanted to watch this weekend, too. I can't think of it right now, but um, I just watched the David Foster special. Netflix really is the gift that keeps on giving. Ooh, oh, oh, I saw Backstreet Boys and got excited, and then I remembered what it was, and I take it back. Okay, yes, I sound very childish and petty right now, but in the year 2000, so happy 20th anniversary to Backstreet Boy Brian Luttrell and his wife, Leanne Wallace, 
They met in the Backstreet Boy video for As Long As You Love Me. It is like the cutest story ever and it makes me sick. They ended up getting married in Georgia and they have a kid together, multiple kids. One of them actually opened up for the Backstreet Boys. He's a singer. Blah, 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 blah. Happily ever after. Cool. Oh my gosh, another one. I love this. Two successful marriages in a row. In 2002, Sarah Michelle Geller, and if you're a Howard Stern fan, you've heard her called Sarah Michelle Gellar for 100 years. She married actor Freddie Prinze Jr. And I love them. They're still together. They are beautiful. Those are two people who have just lived a happy, healthy life. Neither one of them looked like they've had a whole lot of surgeries, if any, and they just look like happy versions of themselves 20 years later. So, well, 18 years later since their marriage. So congratulations to them. Sadly, in 2006, we lost TV personality and animal guru Steve Irwin, the Australian TV personality from The Crocodile Hunter, who was attacked and killed by a stingray at age 44. His daughter's out and about living her best life and really honoring her father and making him so proud. And that's so cool to see. Kelly Clarkson in the year 2002 was named the first ever American Idol winner. And if you ask me, still the best to this day. Lots of other great contestants. I mean, hello, Jennifer Hudson, Adam Lambert. But she's, I think, the best winner of the show in over all those years. Oh my gosh, I feel like we've just had so many successful marriages today. This one is from 2014. My boyfriend, okay, my my boyfriend from New Kids on the Block now. Like as a kid, I like Joey Joe the most, but now as an adult, Donnie Wahlberg does it for me. Hello. Donnie actually married Jenny McCarthy from Singled Out, and they were married in St. Charles, Illinois, and I love this, that uh, they actually met as guests on Bravo's Watch What Happens Live, so love that story and so happy for them. Oh my gosh, this was terrible, and I still think about this death at least a couple times a week. In 2014, Joan Rivers died at age 81 after she had complications from a procedure on her vocal cords. She, of course, was the host of Fashion Police, which is why I loved her so much, but she had also been a comedian on Hollywood Squares. She was the first ever woman to host a late night television show, so a true pioneer for women. She really normalized, well, helped normalize women in comedy. She was an amazing stand-up comedian. I loved her so much. Every Saturday morning, I still miss Fashion Police. It would come on Friday nights, and (laughs) I was young and cool and did things then, so I would save it from Friday night. And Every Saturday morning, I watched Fashion Police, and I still miss it every single week. So rest in peace, Joan Rivers. I will always be a Joan Ranger. Ew, in 2015, this was the first year that Kanye announced he was going to become president. And he said that he was going to run in 2020. And here we are. He said that at the MTV Video Music Awards. And that was one of those things that, can we please just erase? Okay, thanks. In 2018, oh, I love this movie. Do you know that I heard um, Shallow from A Star is Born, the Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper song, just randomly in on the radio a couple weeks ago, and it literally made me cry. Oh, it's so beautiful. Anyway, the fourth remake of A Star is Born, this one featuring Hollywood hottie Bradley Cooper and pop electronica superstar Lady Gaga. Their movie premiered at the Venice Film Festival and I haven't seen A Star is Born in a minute so I actually might need to uh, stream that at some point. I think I'm in the mood for a good cry. Sometimes like nothing's like really wrong. Well (laughs) everything's wrong let's be honest but like nothing terrible like to me right now as far as like I'm not bleeding. I'm feeling well like health, all those like major things. Like I have shelter. I have food in my belly. I'm not like freezing or like burning up to death. Um, All those things are okay, but I'm kind of in a funk. And when I need a good cry, maybe A Star is Born might just be one of my new movies. I haven't needed a good cry in a minute. So maybe A Star is Born will be that for me. 
Ew, the last story I wanted to talk about uh, happened in 2018. Sadly, we had lost music icon Aretha Franklin. Her funeral was held in Detroit, and her funeral was attended by Stevie Wonder, Bill Clinton, Ariana Grande. The procession included 140 pink Cadillacs, which was just so amazing to see. But the reason I ewed at the beginning is because this event was tainted by pervy perverson Charles H. Ellis III, who was the bishop who um, was speaking, Ariana Grande, who, will it, I remember people shading Ariana Grande, like, girl, stay in your lane, um, that's Aretha, why are you singing at Aretha's? Bitches, can I just tell you, because Aretha requested it, like, Aretha said, I want Ariana Grande singing at my funeral, so take a fucking seat, haters, thank you, next. Anyway, speaking of thank you next, thank you next to Bishop Charles H. Ellis III, who groped Ariana during the funeral service. It's a photograph. Oh, it's so disturbing to see. He like reached around her back and grabbed the uh, side of her breast. And you can see her body language. Like she has like moved her body to the opposite side and she's looking at him like glaring. Like, is this happening? You disgusting. It's like the look of disgust and fear and shock all at once well he did apologize but seriously guys don't be disgusting like don't touch women if it's just it's not okay like stop please stop Ah, well, that does it for this week's nostalgic look back on entertainment history for the week's birthdays. We're going to wish a happy birthday, a happy 82nd birthday, amazing, to Elliot Gould. He has all these acting credits from MASH to Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice. And all I know is that that's Monica and Ross's dad. I love Elliot Gould. He's an amazing character actor. Happy birthday. Living legend turning 81 this year, another amazing comedian, Miss Lily Tomlin from 9 to 5, laugh in. She's currently on Grace and Frankie. I stan this actress and comedian, Lily Tomlin. Happy 81st. I strive to be like her so much in life. She's so funny. She's so smart. She stands up for what she believes in, and I am here for her. 70th birthday alert to Dr. Phil. He was born in 1950. I don't like him. I don't see what people see in him. I don't understand why people watch that show. And he is like an Oprah person. Like he was on Oprah and that's how he ended up getting his own show. Like I am with Oprah on a lot of things, but I don't get the Dr. Phil thing, but happy birthday anyway. Adrian Maloof celebrates a birthday this week. Happy 59th to the former Real Housewife of Beverly Hills, who we recently saw on the finale. We've seen her a few times this season, which was very nice. Oh, my boyfriend, Keanu Reeves, has a birthday. Did you guys know he was born in Beirut? I don't know how I didn't know that. I knew he was Lebanese, but I didn't know he was born in Lebanon. That hunk turns 56, and if we could all be that lucky, and I need to know who has watched the new Bill and Ted movie. I'm watching it, I think, tomorrow. My husband and I have like a little date around it planned, so I'm excited for that. I hope it's good. It looks so good. The preview looked amazing, and um, some people put in the fanny pack that they've watched it, and everybody has enjoyed it, so I'm so excited. Happy 54th birthday to the goddess that is Salma Hayek. Oh, gosh, I'll never not picture Salma Hayek in that scene in From Dust Till Dawn when she's pouring the champagne down her leg, down her foot into Tarantino's mouth. Yeah, I just always picture that. Anyway, um, Tamara Judge and her lack of belly button turn 53. Camille Grammer, another real housewife of Beverly Hills that we've just seen a lot lately, turns 52. And can I just say, I'll take more Maloof and less Grammer any day. One of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. I went to a Top Chef filming. And first of all, I stand Top Chef. If you love, I, I need to convince my husband, who's a chef, I stand reality TV. He is a chef and loves Top Chef. Like, why aren't we doing a Top Chef podcast? Like, I'll talk about the reality aspect of it. He'll talk about the chefing aspect of it, and it would be amazing. Anyway, 
Padma is stunning. We weren't supposed to look at her. When you sign to go into a Top Chef filming, you have to like agree that it's like a party and you're not going to like look at the judges or stare because it's supposed to be a party and like not them being celebrities. But she walks into a room and eyes are attached. She is perfection. And did you know this woman turned 50 this week? 50 I mean JLo and Padma are 50 year olds like this new trend of what 50 looks like is really something something else I mean who and speaking of stunners she's 48 this week Cameron Diaz will be part of that club soon I mean it's ridiculous Happy birthday to Scott Speedman, who I love from Felicity, who I always wanted Felicity to end up with. He turns 45. Queen Beyonce turns 39 this week. So happy birthday to Beyonce. Lala from the Bravo show Vanderpump Rules turns 30. So happy dirty 30 to Lala. One Direction's Liam Payne turns 27 and making me feel very old is Zendaya, that lovely young actress, singer, dancer. She's 23 and such a little fashionista. I just absolutely love all of her looks. Well, thank you for tuning in to On This Day Entertainment, the podcast for all your TV and pop culture nostalgia and news from today and yesterday. If you want to stay in the know, subscribe to On This Day Entertainment wherever you get your podcasts. Remember to follow On This Day Entertainment on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. While you're on Facebook, search the groups for The Fanny Pack. That's the On This Day Entertainment group where we keep these conversations going and more. You can always deep dive my articles at onthisdayentertainment.com. While you're there, you will also see On This Day Entertainment merch, including fanny packs, t-shirts, tote bags, coffee cups, stickers, and there's some new Real Housewives of New York merch from Leah and Sonorita. And that's where you'll also find live events. I'm actually taking this Wednesday off from my live Instagram takeovers, but I've got some fun guests lined up for the next several weeks. So you can always check out Instagram at Taste of Reality. I do the takeovers um, from my page on the Stay Entertainment. So hopefully I will see you there. And until next time, you're too cool to be forgotten. Later, skater. Later, skater.